All right, Hotep, uh, Brother Kaba, how you doing today? Hotep to my brother M. Hotep. I'm doing excellent, brother. All right, excellent, man. Good to, good to have you on uh, once again on uh, the African History Network show. And I know you are uh, out and about. But I talked to you yesterday, and uh, you know, I was telling you I was at the 6th uh, Annual Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo in Atlanta, and you were telling me about uh, an online, you were telling me about a, a class that you teach. You're teaching it in the uh, Newark, New Jersey area. And it's a six week course on um, a history of West Africa, ancient to 1492, a history of West Africa, ancient to 1492. And I said, well, look, man, we have to uh, talk about this on the show. So. Tell, tell people, give people an overview of what this uh, class is about. Well, the class, my brother, in Hotep. Do you hear um, Echo, brother? Yeah, Echo. And so I had mentioned to the group the importance of understanding West Africa in order to understand the Moors going into Spain because of the Almoravids and the Almohade dynasty. So, okay. So they asked me if I would do an extension of the classes to go into West Africa. But the other thing we spoke about yesterday was the difference between episodic history and corrective history. Right. And in order to understand the great kingdoms of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, you also have to understand what happened before that. Correct. Because what they do, they do the same thing in Egypt, is when you do episodic history, you look at Egypt or Kemet from the first dynasty. Right. And what you notice is that Egypt is coming into a very high level civilization from its inception. So that is where you get people telling you that the aliens came and uh, Eurasians built it and all the rest of this, mm -hmm. because episodically they introduced you to a time in Kemet history where things are at a very high level. So to understand Kemet, you have to understand Kush, because what built Kemet, or Egypt, was the Kushite dynasties that existed before the dynasties existed. In fact, the dynasties came into existence through the Kushite dynasty. The same is true for West Africa. Right. The reason why you have to do a corrective history, which is to look at history along a, a continuous belt, not just the episode of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, looking at it from 300 BC on. So in my research, what you come to realize is that the civilizations that preceded what we call ancient Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, particularly ancient Ghana, were the Dartichit, the Darwalata, the Darnima, and the Dartangent civilization that existed 2000 BC. Now, some people will push it back even further, but to stay conservative and to stay with my primary sources, I go to 2000 BC. Okay. Because mm -hmm. you have to look at geology. Right. Because now in geology, you have to understand that what is happening is that in North Africa around 6000 BC, there are climactic changes, which are going to turn grasslands and very fertile land into dunes and deserts. So you have to understand climate to understand why Africans in the grassland are going to move north and they're going to move south. The Africans that move south are going to move into what we call southern Mauritania today. Okay. That civilization in, in southern Mauritania, Africans, are going to build the civilization that are later going to be created, later going to create what we call ancient Ghana, that is going to become Mali, and are going to become Soninke. And the people that are going to build ancient Ghana are the Soninke. So there's a relationship in West Africa. Okay. So that even at that, the fourth week, we're then going to look at religion, particularly the ones that came 
to the United States, we're going to look at the Yoruba Orishas, and we're going right. to study the spirituality of West Africans, and we're going to study the education of West Africans, and then we're going to dedicate one class to the Dogon culture of West Africa. Okay, dedicate one class to the Dogon culture of West Africa. Yeah, once a month. Okay, on Saturday. So the classes, the next class is August 19th, August 19th, 2017. Uh, then after that, September 16th, October 21st, November 18th, December 16th. And this is at um, African Spectrum Dance Studio, 30 Central Avenue, Newark, New Jersey. African Spectrum D Dance Studio, 30 Central Avenue, Newark, New Jersey. Okay. Um, and for more information, uh, call Ayana or Greg at 973-388-4900, 973-388-4900, or 862-944-8860, 862-944-8860. All right. So let me, let me back up for a minute. You talked about Dar Tichet. And you talked about some other um, civilizations, some other kingdoms. Uh, what were those other kingdoms you talk, talked about? And what period of time are we talking about that these existed? What, what you're looking at, and this is what our next class is going to deal with, Dar Tichit, Dar Walata, Dar Nema, and Dar Ten. Okay. What you're going to see is that these civilizations are going to be an agro or agricultural pastoral people that are going to attempt to move away from the drying up of the grasslands, which is going to become the Sahara. And they're going to bring their agricultural pastoral, raising sheep and goats and animals like that. They're going to move these civilizations south. And that kingdom because of the nature of the weather is going to develop itself and going to move into higher levels we're also going to look at the knock culture and okay and okay culture of nigeria mm -hmm. yeah the knock culture of nigeria which is in the what we call yoruba land or west nigeria or or the northern part of that's going to go into um yoruba land knock culture okay which is a phenomenal culture that was at a zenith 1000 BC. So if it was at a zenith in 1000 BC, then how long did it exist in it transforming itself into that civilization? What? And the way in which they know it is because of its, um, its artifacts, like the lost wax system of developing uh, African uh, artifacts such as the knock culture head, a uh, phenomenal piece of work. It's called Lost Wax Method. And um, so we're going to be looking at a, 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 um, a piece of Africa that is equivalent. You know, the, the Soninke Empire was larger than Europe. And also it, it, it uh, challenged even the size of the United States. You're talking about a vast land that was developed and had a working government. It was a nation state. It had an economic system, a transportation system, a trading and communication system. It had everything that a modern civilization would have. 1,000 BC. And you can push the um, Darwalata back 2000 BC, some people say even more. Now what's important about that is that these civilizations are coexisting when the pyramid age is existing in Egypt. Right, okay, so... So, so when Dr. Clark used to mm -hmm. say all of Africa was great, right. it's important to understand we, we get caught up with Egypt, which is uh, relevant, Right. but West Africa was as dynamic. Right, exactly. Okay, so I, I, I want you to do this. These different cultures, because we have people listening on YouTube, blog, blog talk, and Facebook Live, okay? So, Dartichet, that's D-A-R-T-I-C-H-I-T. How, how do you spell Dartichet? It's, it's two words, D-A-R. 
Okay. Star, and then it's T I C H E T T. Okay, T I C H E T T. Okay, so Dar Tichet, uh, that was in the area of modern day Nigeria. Is that correct? No, so Dar Tichet is going to be in southern Mauritania. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, knock is not knock is in Nigeria. Uh, Dar Tichet is in southern uh, Mauritania. Okay. Okay, so what period of time is Dartichet? Does Dartichet exist? Well, we know that it is in effect 2000 BC. Okay, so going back to at least 2000 BC, we see Dartichet existing. Yes, I've seen research that pushes it to 4000 BC. Okay, all right. Well, because we want to be careful with what I say. Right, exactly. <laughs> will call you out and I want to be accurate but even if it was 2000 BC you are dealing with civilizations that are existing before the Roman Empire absolutely absolutely okay so it's important that we understand and it's not that I'm comparing it to Europe right what I'm trying to give folk an understanding of is that African history North East Central South go back a long way the further back you go the blacker you go absolutely absolutely okay so we have Dartiche, which was in southern mauritania that dates back to at least 2000 bc okay and what i'm doing is i'm i'm, I'm posting this on the thread of our facebook live broadcast so people can um see how this is spelled and things like this also so what was the next what was the next civilization you talked about you have Darwalata. Okay, how do you spell that? Same D A R. Now I've also seen Dar spelled D H A R. Okay. D A R. You have Darwalata, D A R, then it's W A L A T A. Okay, W A L A T A. W A L A T A. And where was Darwalata? Where was that located? general location at dark kitchen in southern mauritania okay in southern mauritania also and how far back does this date darwalata same, same exact date okay 2000 bc and again at least uh-huh and you know when we start doing the proper research from our own perspective the dates will go back and forth and again they were also an agro pastoral people right Right. Okay, that's okay. fine. Yeah. Then you have Darnema. Okay. A R N E M A. Okay, but but hold hold on before we leave Dar Dar Darwalata, I had a question for you about Darwalata. So when you say so, Darwalata is existing basically at the same time as Dar Tichet in what today we call Southern Mauritania. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Now we're. To the research that we're doing. Okay, now were these cities or were these kingdoms or were these countries? What exactly were these? These were settlements mm -hmm. that were developing themselves around escaping the oncoming desert. Okay. They were Africans that lived in the area that was grassland, that had hippopotami, that had animals, that had crocodiles. And what's going to happen during what we call in the geological era that we call the Holocene period, H-O-L-O-C-E-N-E, -E, in the Holocene period, in this area of Africa coming up out of the Ice Age, because while it was an Ice Age in, in the northern polar cap, mm -hmm. it was heavy rain season in North Africa. Okay. That's the climate that was in Africa, very heavy rain. You, you And then you had humid seasons, and then you had dry seasons. Okay. There came a time when the dry seasons existed longer than the humid system, or the humid weather. So that is when dunes began to come about, which are sand, hills of sand, that are going to blow the sand 
from east to west in North Africa. And the way in which they know that is that they've looked at the they've looked at the bed of the Atlantic Ocean and have seen and been able to identify uh, soil in the ocean to be identified with the soil of North Africa. This is the evidence. We're dealing with evidence here. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So this was the oncoming of the Sahara by six thousand five thousand BC. You have the desert that is now beginning to encroach on the grassland. Africans are going to move north away from Sahara mm -hmm. Desert, and you have Africans that are going to move south on the grassland. Okay. So that by 4,000, 3,000 BC, you have Africans that are settling, and they're bringing in agriculture. They're going to depend on the millet. They're going to plant millet, which is going to become very important in terms of, in, 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 in fact, it's called bush millet, in particular, that has a lot of protein and a lot of different things. They're going to grow that, and the more they're going to grow it, the better they're going to eat, the better they're going to eat, the more they're going to develop their civilization. Out of this is going to become the trade. They're going to be trading gold and salt and all sorts of different um, uh, situations. So the trade is going to happen. Okay. So then you're going to have the caravan. And so Dar Walada, Dar Tichet, Dar Nima are all going to be over 400 settlements, mm -hmm. which could be the beginnings of cities, over 400 of them, settlements. Okay. It's going to grow. And over time, you're going to have thousands of people coming to this area, perfecting agriculture, perfecting uh, the, the, the uh, pastoral life. They're going to continue to develop. They're going to continue to do this work. And then by 300 BC, you're going to have the actual city state of what we call ancient Ghana. Right. Wagadu. Wagadu was, was the original name. Wagadu. Okay. Um, how you pronounce it? Wugadu. O U is pronounced like Wu. Okay, Wugadugu. Okay, because it's it's spelled W A G what W A G A D U, something like that. Um okay. And by the way, the king was called the Ghana. Yeah, yeah. The king was called the Ghana. Like, like during the, the, the Malinke Empire or the Mali Empire, he was called Mansa. Right, right, Mansa. Like Mansa Musa. Okay, so the king was so the kingdom became known as the name of the king. Right. So the king, the king was called the Ghana. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have Dartichit, we have Darwalata, and then next, is that the Nak culture that's next that you talked about? Well, you also have Darnima, N E M A, and Dartangent, which is T A N G E N. I've seen it with a T at the end, also tangent. Uh, I've seen it as T A G E N T. But basically, what we're talking about are individual areas with settlements of people that are going to eventually develop themselves into working nation states, which eventually is going to become Ghana. Ghana is then going to become Mali. Right. Mali is going to become Soninke. Now, in understanding these civilizations, you understand the continuity of African genius, because these are the Africans that are eventually are going to find their way up into Europe, along with the North Africans. Now, when you say find their way, trading. yeah, when you say find their way up into Europe, are you talking about the Moors going in in 711 AD? Or are you yes. talking about before then? Yes. Okay. Well, okay. Before then, but particularly, but particularly from the 711 to 1492 period. Okay, 711 to 1492, right. When the when the when the Moors go because, in. I mean, you mm -hmm. have, yeah, you you know, you have Batica who is going into Spain 1100 BC. Right. You have Tahaka of the 25th dynasty going into Spain. Mhm. Mm in the 700 BC, 700 BC, you have right. Africans in Europe before the Moors of 710. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Okay. But I'm focused on the Moors of 710 to 1492. Right. Okay, so you said Dar Darnama, and you said Dar Darnima. 
N E M A, okay. Darnema, and you said Dartangent, and that's T A N. How you spell that? G E N T. Okay, T A N G E N T. Now, what period of time do these um, uh, cities or civilizations exist? At the same time, you're, you're all right. Two thousand BC. Uh, basically, I'm giving the I'm giving the date two thousand BC. Some people push it back further than that. Okay, all right. So two thousand BC. Now the knock the knock culture uh, was this in the same area, like in southern Mauritania? No, not no, no. Into what we today call Benin, and Benin and Nigeria. The knock culture. Okay, what period of time is this for the knock culture? We see the knock culture developing high, high civilized artifacts. One thousand BC. Okay. 1000 BC in the area of Benin and Nigeria. Exactly. And for all the reasons with doc, the work of Dr. Sheikh Abdel Diop mm -hmm. in his work, you can connect it with religion. You can connect this with, uh, you can connect Africa, the cultural unity of Africa through Dr. Diop's work, civilizational barbarism, myth and reality, his book, The Cultural Unity of Black Africa. The Black Federated State, you can connect these through language. Right. You can connect it through religion. You can connect it through trade. You can connect it, and I'm talking about evidence. Okay. Absolutely. And that's. And I'm, you know, I'm not talking about facts. I don't deal with facts. Mm hmm. Because facts can change as we see. Right. Well, right. It's going to work. Right. Well, why why wouldn't we deal with facts and evidence, and facts as they relate? Because because facts can change. Like like for instance, it's a right. fact that yesterday it rained in New York. Right. Well, no, no that's true. It mm -hmm. rained today. Right. Right. No. Well, it was a fact at that time. It was true at that time. Right. Right. So exactly. So, mm -hmm. so when you deal with evidence, it transcends all time and space. Right. Right. It's um uh, it's like archaeological evidence. It's um exactly. so, it's solid, right. So mm -hmm. this and you, you you know the brother that dropped this information on me. Dr. David M. Hotel. Yeah, I know because he dropped it on me yeah. also. <laughs> I've interviewed him a number of times. Yep, he dropped it on me also. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, said, Go with evidence. evidence never changes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, so that's where I got that idea from. I'm growing with that brother. That brother and I have been in contact, talking, and I mean, he's been dropping some pearls on me. Yes. And as I've begun to realize, this is what we have to go into our classroom, and this is what we have to start discussing because we have primary sources. Right. Right. They can't touch this. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Hey, if you're just tuning, okay, stand by just a minute, Brother Cabo. All right. If you're just tuning in, you listen to the African History Network show. Uh, we're broadcasting uh, on Blog Talk Radio on our Blog Talk Radio channel, the African History Network show. We're also broadcasting on uh, our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network on Facebook and uh, on our YouTube channel as well. OK, so uh, you can listen on uh, one of those platforms. And uh, you can also call in and listen by phone, 914-338-1375, 914-338-1375 uh, is the call-in number if you have a question or comment, uh, or you can just listen there, 914-338-1375. Uh, if you have a question or comment, press the number one key to put you in queue so we could bring you on the air, all right? Press the number one key uh, uh, to put you in queue so we could bring you on the air. And when you call in, now we're short on time because I have another guest coming on at the top of the hour. So we're not going to have time for dissertations and manifestos. OK, we need you to go ahead and answer your ask your question so we can get an answer from Professor Kaba Um, And then also I want to remind you of uh, uh, Friday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I teach my online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We do with thousands of years of history. 
it's a, a 12 hour six week online course as soon as you register you can watch the first four sessions and we have 12 hours of bonus content go to africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com you can register there and get more information okay so um professor kaba uh, you, you we talked about them when i talked to you yesterday you know we talked about the moors it was either yesterday or the day before you know we talked about the moors going into europe and they go in 711 a.d and we talked about uh the general Tariq, who was a general in uh tarif's army the arab tarif's army and i, I asked the question about uh, when did moorish women go into the iberian peninsula because they first go into the iberian peninsula they known as spain and portugal i said but you know initially i don't read about women going in just men so where did the moorish women come from tell us that please the, the moorish women over the 700 odd year period are going to come as it relates to their profession mm -hmm. and they're also going to be born within al andalusia through the marriages and the cohabitation of africans with the indigenous people or the people who are in Spain, Portugal. Mm -hmm. But they're going to come through their profession. They're going to come through religion. Because according to the religious system of Islam, many of the Africans that went would have brought eventually their wives, but you're going to have the military going first. Right. And then as time goes on, you're going to have the different levels of craft people coming in the agriculturalists are going to come in the uh the masons are going to come in the doctors are going to come in the lawyers are going to come in right and there will be women that will be coming with them okay so first the warriors are going to go in yeah the land mm -hmm. is the military. so the warriors go in first and they're fighting the vandals and the visigoths and they're going to defeat them and then from my understanding they're going to settle in the southern portion there of the Iberian Peninsula that they call Al Andalus. Is that correct? Yes, but they're going to push into Europe. But by the time they get oh, yeah. across the Pyrenees and they're going to come upon uh, a, a warrior, uh, Charles Martel, mm -hmm. grandfather of Charlemagne. Right. And he's, a, he's quite a warrior. He's going to push them back. Mm -hmm. But they don't mind going back because the weather for what they want to do so the weather is more agreeable when you look at Spain diagonally from the Ebro River in the east, the Guadarrama Mountains in the north, that literally cut on a diagonal the peninsula of Spain and Portugal, and then the southern coast of Spain and Portugal. So Al Andalusia is going to be like a, a um, diagonal country. Okay. And north of the Guadalama Mountain, you're, you're going to have very unagreeable weather that's not going to agree with people who are coming from Africa. Right. It's going to be damp and it's going to be cold. And you're, you're not going to be able to grow the things that you want to grow if you're an agriculturalist. The animals are going to be different according right. to what you'd like to do. So they basically are going to settle eventually by 1100 in what we call Al Andalusia. Mm -hmm. uh, Andalusia, right now that means to walk in the spiritual path or walk in the spiritual light when you look at the spanish language and when you look at uh the the arabic language al like mm -hmm. al islam right gives you the concept of something spiritual right coming off the word allah mm -hmm. al gives a spiritual andar in spanish means to walk mm -hmm. And loose means light. Light, right, right. Now, Al Andalusia, mm -hmm. from that language, gives the impression that you are walking in a spiritual light. Yeah, walk the walking in a spiritual light. But Al, that A L, that prefix, uh, from my understanding, that also means of the, like alchemy, of chemistry, because because we see the Al prefix in algebra alcohol alchemy al andalus that 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 prefix that arabic prefix doesn't that mean of the also well when you look at the prefix all the things you just named 
mm-hmm. also deals with something very spiritual. Mm-hmm. Alchemy. Right. Algebra. Right. So it, it, it all has the manifestation of a concept of spiritual. Now, Al is also going to become L. And that's why you have a lot of Moors whose names are, are Bay, mm-hmm. which really is Ba, but, and L. Okay, L. You're either an L or you're a Bay. Right, E L, L. And L is a derivative, and L also is part of the Romance languages when you're dealing with L or, or Aya, which is male and female. In French, you have ill, but it all comes out of this uh, relationship. Okay. So, um, also, you have Al when you deal with Al Kibalan, because from my understanding and talking to Renoko Rashidi, Al Kibalan is an Arabic word as well. So, you have that prefix once again, Al, A L. Um, yes. Okay. So, and you talked about um, Bay, B E Y, and Ba, B A, not that. Ba, does that relate? Is that Ba as in the soul coming from ancient Kemet in the metal netter where you have the Ba and the Ka, the soul and the spirit? It's possible. I cannot verify that, but I always try to put a, a combination together. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, in, in, in order. So whenever I see things that are like when you deal with the word Ra, you mm-hmm. know, I always try to put the connection because there are connections. Right. Right. I definitely understand that. Definitely understand that. Okay. Uh, once again, if you have a question for Brother Kaba, give us a call. 914-338-1375. 914-338-1375. Uh, is the call in number. Uh, if you have a question or comment, press the number one key. 914-338-1375. All right. Stand by, everybody. Hey, I want to let you know. Um, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have a lot of informa- information there for you. Those watching on Facebook, share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. We have the Black Friday documentaries at our website. You can order them now. Uh, we have the Black Friday documentaries, Black Friday, what legacy will you leave? This deals with strategies to recycle our $1.3 trillion economy and leave intergenerational wealth for our families. You have Dr. Claude Anderson in here. You have Dr. Chika Akua, Dr. Umar Johnson, Dr. George Frazier, uh, hip hop artist David Banner, Hill Harper, myself, Michael M. Hotep. You have Dave Anderson, founder of the Empowerment Radio Network, Tony Browder in here as well. You got a lot of people in the, in this documentary. We have that at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Also, we have Elementary Genocide 1 and 2. Elementary Genocide 1 and 2 from director Raheem Shabazz. We have a bundle pack for these DVDs also. We get a big discount. This These documentaries deal with the school to prison pipeline, fighting against the school to prison pipeline. They deal with education for our children also. And you have uh, Dr. Umar Johnson, Dr. Boyce Watkins, hip hop artist uh, Killer Mike. Uh, you have Dr. Steve Perry, uh, just to name a few uh, of the people in these documentaries. I am in uh, Elementary, Elementary Genocide Part 3, which comes out August 22nd from director Raheem Shabazz. So look out for that. Professor Kaba Kamenea is in there. Professor James Small, uh, two of my teachers. You have Shahrazad Ali. So look out for that as well. OK, uh, remember, on Fridays, I teach an online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay. This is a 12 hour, six week online course. Uh, as soon as you register, you can uh, watch the first four sessions. All the sessions are recorded. Okay. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. And we also have about 12 hours of bonus content. We deal with thousands of years of history. Uh, we deal with the Moors. We deal with ancient Kemet. We do a lot of information. We just posted the link here on our Facebook fan page, the African history network, the African history network, uh, right here on the thread. of the um, You know, we talked about uh, a couple of days ago when you and I talked is I got back from uh, Atlanta, man, about two 30 Tuesday morning. I got back from Atlanta um from uh, the black homeschooling conference and i was filming uh my portion of black friday part two um as well and we have the black friday documentaries once again at our website 
africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com uh black friday with legacy where you leave you can order those there and you get one of my dvd lectures free brother Cobbers in the documentaries also um you know you and i we talked and we talked about I, I said you know from my research on the moors it seems like the moors benefited europe much more than europe benefited the moors in africa and we were, you and i were talking about some of the things that the moors introduced into europe and they all came back to kick us in the behind cotton rice sugar tobacco talk about that for a minute please you know, you're absolutely correct. In fact, I could even extend that to any time we've ever come in contact with <laughs> of your, of, of your region culture. Right. We've only given more to the culture than was given to us, including the African-American experience. Right, right. I, I agree with that. We're dealing with that right now in Detroit. But <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Absolutely. absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Uh, you know, that is just the way things are. Whether you're dealing with Kemet, you know, we gave, we formulated the, the, the Greek nation. Mm -hmm. When you deal with the Romans and their, their relationship with North Africa. Right. They developed themselves around what they learned from the Greeks and what they learned from the Africans. Okay. So what we're talking about is we have always given the world something that they just have not been able to reciprocate with us. Right. It's just the way it is, you know? Right. But what this is going to lead to is some of your biggest slave plantations. Once you, the Moors are going to be conquered, you have uh, you, you, you have the Portuguese getting involved in the transatlantic slave trade right around 1440. They're going to dominate for the first 200 years from, from 1440 to 1640. You look at the transatlantic slave trade existing from 1440 to 1888 when it's finally abolished in Brazil. But you look at the largest slave plantations, you're going to see cotton plantations, rice plantations, sugar plantations, and tobacco. And these were all things that the Moors introduced into Europe. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Now, I remember you talking about how, because when we study Columbus in August 3rd, 1492, setting sail on the Nina, the Penta, and the Santa Maria, and I remember you talking um, some years ago, and you talked about how uh, one of the things that Columbus was also looking for, in addition to spices and gold and silver, things like this, he was looking for another source of sugar, okay? Talk about that for a minute, and why was another source of sugar so important for Columbus to find? Well, sugar, um, um, in fact, you can even go back to Marco Polo. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and his impact and his relationship with Africans. You can look at uh, Africans going into Europe and then the, the same routes that Africans came into and bringing uh, silk and things from Asia and products from Africa into Europe um, is going to be something that Europe never uh, experienced. Right. So what's going to happen is that they are going to um, get hooked on sugar. The Europeans. Yeah, the Europeans get hooked on sugar, and sugar is a drug also. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it was very expensive. And so they were looking uh, to be able to capitalize on the products that were brought into um, into um Europe. And so when uh, there's a um, Martin Fraginales did a phenomenal piece on uh, the Cuban sugar plantation where he talked about um, sugar and the impact that sugar had on uh, Europe. Okay. And the other types of herbs and spices and uh, things that were brought into Europe by Africans that Europeans had never experienced before. And again, you go back to climate. You know, you can't grow sugar in a climate like what is in Europe. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, these different the fruits, the vegetables, the strawberries, the oranges, the olives, all of this was brought into Europe by uh, Africans. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And so 
eventually they're going to capitalize on it. And the sugar that was put into the early days of, of the liquors that were drunk, the beers and wines and the things like that. Because in Africa, you know, everybody said, well, Africans had beer and wine. They did, but they used the fermentation of the fruit. Right. What we have in alcohol today and beer and wine is the addition of alcohol, <laughs> which is another form of fermentation, but it's not the best fermentation for the human body. Okay. So you have the fermentation of grapes. Right. Anything that turns brown ferment. Mm -hmm. Watermelon, apples. You know, you can ferment it and in drinking it after its fermentation process, and then you have the hops and the grains that become beer. And so you you, you have this system existing right. where Europeans are going to want to capitalize and, and once they are able to defeat the Moors in 1492, Boabdil, once they defeat them, then they're able to return back. And one of the things that they knew was to come to America. Okay. Christopher Columbus himself, you know, was aware of West African voyages to the Americas. We find him on the coast of West Africa, the Cape Verde Islands. Because remember, he's the Portuguese at this time. He's not with the Spaniards. Well, in 14, yeah, in like 1486, 82, because he's selling around the yeah. west coast of Africa, picking up uh, Africans as slaves, uh, 1482. Well, not just that, but mm. he's with Africans that are doing it. Okay, right. Now explain that. You said he's with Africa in 1482. He's with the Portuguese. He's not with the Sp he's not with the Spanish crown yet. Okay. Uh, now, now he was born in Genoa, Italy. Okay, Columbus was born in Genoa. That's well, that's what they say. Yeah, he was born in Genoa, Italy. At this point, he's with the Portuguese, and Spain and Portugal are right next to each other. Okay, um, and you said he's with Africans picking up slaves around the west coast of Africa. So explain that, and who were these Africans he was with? Well, not just Africans. Mm -hmm. He is. I, I, he's, he, he's not just picking up Africans. He's picking up trade. He's trading with West Africa. Okay. And in this trade, he's hearing, see, there, there are two types of Africans that are going to come out of 1492. There are Africans that are indigenous to Africa and brought to America. And there are Africans indigenous to Spain mm -hmm. and Portugal that are brought to America. Okay, now when you say brought to America, you're talking about these are enslaved, they're going to be enslaved African people brought brought to America. That have been captured in, in Spain. Okay. Okay, like Estebanico is one of the, is, is an African, he is not an African from Africa, he's an African from Spain. Right, okay. And uh, I remember... For 700 years, these Africans have been in Spain. Right. Right. You, you know, it's like looking at an African here from America and an African from the continent. Right. Okay. We have lineage that goes back to Africa. Mm -hmm. But we basically, for generations, for centuries, have lived in America. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Now, the third type of African that's in America is the African that has been in here from the very beginning of the peopling of America. Okay. Okay. And that would be like the Khoisan. Those, those would be the Khoisan and the descendants of the Khoisan, the Ainu, the Twa, etc. That's what you're referring to. The Paleo American. The Paleo American that he talks about, right? And that includes the that includes the Khoisan. That includes the Khoisan who have the oldest DNA on the planet. Okay. I I, I want that. And also the Right, exactly. They come from Southern Africa uh, as well. Okay. Um, because see, the other thing, Brother Hotep, mm -hmm. that we have to understand is that some of us in America, many of us in America, have African blood that, that the origin of that African blood was here before the people we call indigenous people were here. Now, when you say, okay, hold on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish that thought. Go ahead. I'm 
I'm saying, and if you want to see what they look like, just go to David Mhotep's book. Mm -hmm. The first Africans were Americans. Look at the front cover, and you'll see what those Africans look like. Yeah, that was a brother from South America. He was from uh, Tierra del Fuego, if I remember correctly, which is yeah, the southernmost the tip, the land of fire. The most part of South America. Right, the southernmost part. Okay, now uh, I, I want you to back up for a minute because I want to. I want to hone in on this two things. We're going to talk about Estaba Nico because we we have a few minutes left before uh, Jamon Jordan comes on. Uh, I want to talk about Estaba Nico, and then you you, you just talked about uh, how we have. Uh, some of us, uh, you talked about indigenous, uh, the indigenous people. When you talked about the indigenous people, or, or you, I think you say we have uh, ancestry that goes back before the indigenous people, something like this, right? Were, were you talking about the people who we call Native Americans, or were you talking about the Africans who were here in this land we call the United States of America before Native Americans came into existence? Who specifically are you talking about? I'm talking about Okay, hold on. You break it. Migrate. You you okay, you're breaking up you're breaking up uh, a little bit. Go ahead and repeat that statement again. I'm talking about Native Americans. I'm talking about people like the Cherokee, the Arapaho, the Apache. Okay. Um, you know, the, the Zuni. They came later. Right. They are not the original Americans. The original Americans date back. It's hard to say because when I talked to Dr. Imhotep today, he told me that they have found people 130,000 years old in America. Well, yeah, that that uh, I talked to him about that. I actually sent him some information on that. That was coming out of San Diego. That was the discovery made. That was the discovery revealed April 26, 2017, about master about the mastodon yeah. skeleton in San Diego. And the paleontologists were saying that that skeleton was taken apart by humans using stone tools. OK, so if this is true, then this puts um, uh, now they didn't say it was homo sapiens. They didn't say it was modern man. But just humans, okay? If this is true, this puts a human presence in the land we call the United States of America a hundred thousand years before we were told by modern archaeology that humans were here. The oldest civilization they point to here in this land we call the United States of America is the Clovis culture, which dates back about 13,000 years ago in New Mexico, the Clovis culture. So um, they want to do more research to verify this, but most likely you're going to find out that that's true. And we know that in Morocco in early June, they found skeletons of homo sapiens, modern man, homo sapiens that date back between 300,000 to 350,000 years ago, which is over a hundred thousand years before the, oldest human fossils they had of modern man which were in ethiopia that dated back 195,000 years ago okay so th this these these archaeological discoveries are coming out each month man <laughs> these archaeological discoveries yes. are coming out each month brother but um okay so and, go and ahead go ahead to add to what you're saying mm -hmm. is that the leopoldi footsteps mm -hmm. that were found in the area they have now been able to develop machines that can measure the footprint. And what they're finding out is that the Laetoli footprints are footprints of an erect human being. So if that, if those footprints are dated and they are given characteristics of an Australopithecine or Australopithecine, it means that you've got to push everybody back millions of years because it's obvious that man was and woman was walking erect at the time that we think they were archaeopithecine. Okay. So now even science is showing that when you're dealing with Homo habilis and Homo erectus and Homo sapiens and then Homo sapiens sapiens, 
you're going to have to push the entire human family back millions of years. Right, right. Which I believe will eventually be done. Right, yeah, the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. Absolutely. Okay, well, go ahead. Then the civilization that's going to come out of that is going to be older than what they're saying today. Absolutely. Okay, Leo Tolley footprints. How do you spell Leo Tolley? L-A-E-T-O-L-I. Okay, L-A-E-T-O-L-I. Okay, Leo Tolley footprints. And who were the Leo Tolley? The, the Leo Tolleys were, were, were imprints found in East Africa where there must have been some form of a volcano. And then over hundreds of years, people walked across the ash of the volcano. Okay. And, chance, and they left their footprint in the ash. And it shows groups of African people. Up until now, they've been saying that these were Australopithecines. Okay. But now that they've been able to measure the footprint, it's showing, you know, when you walk hunched over in the early days, it's different than when you walk erect. Your right. footprint is different. Right. You know, when you walk erect, the whole foot is shown. You right. You can measure the depth of the arch of the foot. Absolutely. So what what was said to be millions of years ago, now whoever was walking there millions of years ago had already advanced to the Homo erectus stage, which means you got to push the Australopithecine way back into the past of these Laetoli footprints. So not only are they dating humans older. They're also finding that the classification of the human family is also proving that humans were more advanced at a much earlier stage. Okay. Very quickly, I want to uh, get clarification on two things here uh, before our next guest comes on. Uh, if you're just tuning in, you listen to the African History Network show uh, right here on Blog Talk Radio or Blog Talk Radio channel blogtalkradio.com forward slash the African History Network show. Uh, also, we're broadcasting on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network. Okay, you talked about Estaba Nico, and you talked about something that's very important. I want to get clarification on this. You talked about how um, Africans were being taken out of Europe, out of Spain, enslaved and taken to the Americas and you talked about Columbus in 1482 involved in the slave trade working with African people talk about that because that's extremely extremely important well African didn't have slaves oh correct they had a cultural yeah, they had a cultural servitude system yeah yeah exactly they had a servitude system mm -hmm. where the person was always considered a human being. Right. The children born from that person were free. Right. It wasn't about not being free. It, you were always free. You were always human. It was just you were in servitude. In Europe, they had the feudal system, which was a disorganized form of slavery. Right. What Moors brought into Europe, although a lot of us don't want to admit this, Mm -hmm. What Africans brought into Europe was an organized system of servitude. Mm -hmm. Europeans took that organized system of servitude, superimposed it over their disorganized surf system, mm -hmm. and that is what became institutional slavery. Right. The very interesting book by Kenneth Sam. It's called That Peculiar Institution. Right. It's a book that needs to be read, along with Philip Higginbotham's book on a matter of color. It's important that we understand that Africans didn't have slaves. Correct. Africans had servants. Mm -hmm. So, and slaves come from the word slav 
anyway. But Africans were in the trade of human beings. They were into human trade, whether we want to admit it or not. It's just a reality. And and at the at during this time, there were more Europeans that were in place than there were Africans. Uh, say that again. Say, say, more, go ahead. More Europeans who were in who were in servitude to Europeans through the feudal system mm -hmm. than Africans, because you know a lot of Africans thought that Europeans were very barbaric to do that to their own people. You said and even Africans had a code of conduct. You, you said a lot of Africans thought Europeans were very barbaric to do that to their own people. Right. Study the feudal system. Right. From the, the lord and the serf. Just look at what they call themselves. They call themselves a lord. Right. And a serf. Yeah. Yeah. That was from the ninth century so to the fourteenth century A.D. The feudal feudalistic system. Yeah. But that's when it was. That's when it was even. Although it was disorganized, it was still at a better state than prior to that. Right. Right. So that Africans are going to be in trade. So Col Columbus, or his name was Cristobal Colon, right. was with the Africans that were in Portugal. The same with Prince Henry the Navigator. They were with Africans going to Africa. So that's how Columbus knew that there was land called America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because... because he, he said, Yeah, go ahead. He, even he said in his journal that he passed Africans returning to Africa on his way to America. Right. He knew exactly where he was going. Right. Exactly. Exactly. He. Um, the Moors are going to introduce spherical globes and almanacs, things like this, into Europe, nautical instruments. So, and he had Moors navigating his ships, also some of his ships. Uh, he had Moors navigating yeah. some of some of his ships. Ship Uh, what was the name again? Pinzon, P I N Z O N. Okay, the Pinzon brothers. Okay. Um, all right. Lastly, you talk. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish that thought. Estevanico, if you want to know Estevanico, there's a good, there's a great chapter in Jan Carew's book Fulcrums of Change that deals specifically with who Estevanico was. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he came to America and traveled the Southwest. And, and he prepared the Native Americans or the people that were there for the Spaniards who were coming behind him because he was an African herbal uh, master, uh, her herbalist, that was able uh, to um, coexist with the shamans of the indigenous people. Right. So he was like a trader, to say the truth. Okay, when you say trader, T R A D E R or T A I T O R? No, he was a T R A I T O R. He was a trader because he mm -hmm. opened the way for Spain to come and eventually the, the indigenous people killed him. Okay. R right. Now, when, we, when you say the indigenous people, you're talking about the people we call Native Americans? Which indigenous? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, the, the griot.com has an article the griot.com people can check this out is called black explorers we should celebrate instead of columbus black explorers we should celebrate instead of columbus this is from october 12 2015 and those watching on our facebook fan page the african history network will post a link here on the thread estava nico is is one that is mentioned and for Estava Nico, uh, they also mentioned mention Juan Garrido, who was uh, who was uh, born in Africa. He was from West Africa, uh, and um, he came with uh, Ponce de Leon uh, to Florida uh, in 1513. Uh, that was Juan Garrido. But they talk about Estava Nico, also called Esta Esteban. And it says, by most accounts, Esteban or Estava Nico was sold into slavery around 1513. In the Portuguese controlled uh, Azmor, A Z E M M 
Okay, so you talked about all right. So those watching on Facebook, we started a new broadcast uh, on Facebook uh, on our fan page. Uh, There's part two, uh, so we'll move that to the top and um, um, watch here. And we'll, and Jamon, just hold on. We're coming to you just a minute, Jamon. Just stand by. All right, um, watch the uh, second broadcast. Facebook. Okay. All right. So now you talk, Brother Cobb, the last thing, and then we're going to uh, give the information again for your six week course. You talked about Africans being taken out of Europe into the Americas and enslaved. Talk about that again. The reason why I say that is because most of the time when we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, we talk about Africans being taken out of Africa, dispersed into the Americas, but not taken out of Europe into the Americas. Talk about that, please. One of the things that the Spaniards did in order to take over what, what's called Al Andalusia, mm -hmm. they displaced Africa. Mm -hmm. And the one way to do it is to resettle them in another land. Okay. So there were Africans that were taken after the conquest of Boabdil and the Moors in 1492. Right. There were many Africans that were well off, that were that, that were shipped to America, just like Europe uh, opened up their prisons and everything to right. Europeans and sent them to America. Well, the very first people that the Spaniards kicked out and sent to America were Africans that were of note. So these were one group of Africans that came to America. So these were Moors. These were African Moors who had been conquered in Spain. And this is after Boabdil loses control of Grenada, the last stronghold that the Moors had in Spain, January 2nd, 1492. They're conquered and now they're being expelled out of Spain and they are conquered and enslaved and they're sent to the Americas by Europeans in Spain. Is that correct? On, on one level, and there are other Africans that are just coming, that are leaving, they're escaping. Okay. To America. Because remember, mm -hmm. the West African connection, West Africans have been coming to America. Egyptians have been coming to America. Right, absolutely. Now, so when, mm -hmm. when, go ahead. So you have Monster Musa's brother, Abu Bakari, who is said to have gotten on a ship and come to America. So you have Africans coming to America. Right. So there are Africans in America that came that were not enslaved, that were not part of the enslavement process from 1492 or 1505 on. Okay. So so we're going to have we're going to have some Moors who are conquered and enslaved and brought to the Americas because they're being kicked out of Spain. Then you're going to have other Moors who are not enslaved, but they're fleeing for uh, uh, they're fleeing uh, what's going on in Spain. And they're coming here more or they're coming to the Americas more voluntarily and they're not enslaved. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. They have the ways and means to do it. OK. Now. And there are some Africans that are returning to Africa. Mm, yeah. OK. They're going back uh, because Spain. Be, because let me, because Spain and Portugal is just right above uh, Morocco, uh, there in North yeah. Africa. So some are going. Some some of the Moors are going back into Morocco, going back into Africa, and some are coming to America. Go ahead and finish your thought. I was just going to say when you look at Beethoven's family, many people say that Beethoven's family fled Spain and went to Bonn, Germany. Mm-hmm. And oh. then from Bonn, Germany, they went to um, uh, to uh, Vienna, Austria. Okay. Because outside of his home in Bonn, Germany, and outside of his home in Vienna, and all you got to do is get the book by Russell that's called Beethoven's Hair, they'll show you a picture of a plaque that's outside Beethoven's home in Bonn, Germany, that says Zwarte Spanier House, which means the Black Spaniard's House. Right, right, the Black Spaniard's House. Okay. All right, let me ask you this. So oh, go ahead. Have, go ahead. Once you have 
Castile and Aragon, Isabella and Ferdinand, taking over Al Andalusia, in particular Granada, you're, you're going to have Africans that are going to be going in all different directions, and then of course you have the ones that remain. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, so let me ask you this question here: When you have African Moors being expelled out of Europe and and they're being they're being conquered and enslaved and sent to the Americas or sent to America. Which America are you talking about? Are you talking about Central America? You're talking about South America? Are you talking about the land today we call the United States of America? Which America are you talking about? I I, I am talking about Spanish America. I, I am talking about Florida. I am talking about the southwestern coast, Arizona, New Mexico. I'm talking about okay. Central America, and I'm talking about the northern part of South America, uh, minus minus the, the Treaty of Tordesillas, which would cut Brazil. Okay, so that was 1494, June 7th, 1494, Treaty of Tordesillas, okay? So you're saying, exactly. you're saying minus, you're saying north, the northern portion of South America minus Brazil. You're talking about Central America, okay? And you're talking about uh, the territory basically in the land we today we call the United States of America that the Spanish had because Spanish had control of Florida. Uh, they go in in 1513. They had control of Florida. And then you talked about Arizona, um, which was part of uh, which was part of Mexico. Uh, um, uh, previously, before it became part of the U.S., that was part of Mexico, right? Arizona. um you know, that territory, California, Utah, Nevada, all that was part of Mexico. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and all and parts of California, all of that is Spanish America. Right. Right. Yeah. I already know the answers to these questions. Doc. I'm just I'm, I'm for the sake of the audience. Man, I'm just <laughs> I already know the U.S. got that territory, the Treaty of Guadalupe in 1848, Treaty of Guadalupe, Hidalgo, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Utah, Nevada. They got those six states in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. Okay, so yeah. uh, and they go ahead. Change the names because they're all Spanish. Uh, those territories, those are all Spanish names. Yeah, Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Florida. Florida. You know, yeah, those are all. You know, uh, 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 linguistically coming out of the Latin prefix. Right. Right. Right, exactly. Or the Latin language, I should say. The Latin language, right, right. That the Spanish are spreading in the territories they go into and then forcing the Spanish language on the people who they are conquering, which is why uh, Hispanics speak Spanish. They're not they're not Spanish. They're, they're, they're not Spaniards. They were conquered by Spain no. and their language, the Spanish language exactly. was forced upon them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So what are a couple of books you can recommend that people can read that will give more information? Because the Africans who were conquered in Spain and, and enslaved and sent to the Americas, that portion of the story, which is part of the transatlantic slave trade, is not talked about a lot. What are some books you could recommend for people to read? Let me recommend people reach out to my uh, website where I have my free e-course. Okay. At kabakamane.com. Okay. K-A-B-A-K-A-M-E-N-E.com. -E -E that has a study guide in it, and it also has, um, it also has my free e-course on my next book, Spirituality Before Religion. Spirituality Before Religion. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And, and, and that can start the dialogue that will have lists of books that, that that they can read, particularly when it gets to the ancient American section of my study guide. OK. All right. So that's Kaba, K-A-B-A, Kamene, K-A-M-E-N-E, Kaba, Kamene dot com. And you can go there and you have uh, books there. But one of the books you recommend is the Peculiar Institution by Kenneth Stamp. Is that correct? Yes. OK. 
MPP, that peculiar institution, which tells you about the, the difference between uh, what we call European enslavement and African servitude. Absolutely. Okay. And I, and I also recommended Fulcrums of Change by Jan Kuru. Okay. A-A-N-C-A-R-E-W. Fulcrums, F-U-L-C-R-U-M-S, of change. Okay. And in that book, Fulcrums of Change by Jan Karu, he talks about African Moors being conquered and enslaved in Spain and Europe and then brought to the Americas. He talks about that in that book, right? And there's an essay, and yes, and there's an essay on Estebanico. And there's also an interesting uh, part of the book, like in, I think it's 109 to 115, where he talks about the origin of the word America came from uh, the the um, the Mesquite, the yeah. Amerisque. Yeah, Los Amerisques. Yeah. Yeah, but you know what's interesting, brother? Mm -hmm. There was a sister in California that saw my presentation where I talked about the Mosquito Coast. Mm -hmm. And the Mosquito, mosquito Coast is not about mosquitoes. Mm. It's Mesquito. Okay. It's about the Mesquito original people there who were African. Mm. And she sent me a book on her people. Okay. And it, it's very interesting, uh, the story of her people in Nicaragua and the indigenous people known as Amerisques, where Alberigo Vespucci right. went to uh, Cristobal Colon, Christopher Columbus, came upon these people and their name is a Mayan word where that means gold, the breath of of the creator, and he renamed himself from Alberigo to Amerigo Vespucci. Right, exactly. Exactly. His born name wasn't Amerigo. This is another piece that um that uh Jan Caruso's book Fulcrums of Change does. It goes through how America really is a Native American name. Yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's, a, it's not just a Native American name, it's an African name because these were a group of black yeah. African people in what today is called Nicaragua. And uh, it's pages like 95 through about 110 of Fulcrums of Change by okay. Jan Carew. Because uh, I talk about okay. that in some of my presentations and I have a slide in there and then I, I, I direct people to the interview that I did with you February 3rd, 2016 when we talked about the origins of the name America. So that show is archived. People can go and listen to that at uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. On the homepage of the website, just click on listen to podcasts uh, of Michael M. Hotel. And that was February 3rd, 2016, that I had Professor Kaba Kamene on, and we broke that down. Also, you may want to read Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Golden Age of the Moor, mm. edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, because Jan Karu, has an essay in that book. So does Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, Renoko Rashidi, Dr. John G. Jackson, uh, Dr. Wayne Chandler, a number of our scholars. Golden Age of the Moor. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, and Edward Scobie has a very interesting essay in that in terms of the Africans in what we today call Portugal. Mm -hmm. For so many times we talk about Spain, but we don't talk about the influence Africans had in Portugal. Right. And Dr. Edward Scobie has a great essay in golden age of the more on Portugal and Africa. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, look, uh, everybody, uh, professor Kaba, those in the new, new work, uh, those in the, uh, New Jersey area. Okay. Uh, new New Jersey, uh, on Saturdays, uh, one Saturday a month, the next class is August 19th. Uh, professor Kaba is doing his, um, series, a history of West Africa, ancient to 1492, a history of West Africa, ancient to 1492. This is taking place uh, August 19th, September 16th, October 21st, November 18th, and December 16th, 2017, 3 p.m. Uh, is it 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. or what? 3 to 6. 3, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., uh, it meets on Saturdays, one Saturday a month at African Spectrum Dance Studio, African Spectrum Dance Studio, located at 30 Central Avenue, Newark, New Jersey, 30 Central Avenue, Newark, New Jersey, 
corner of, of Halsey Street above Central Restaurant, okay? Tuition is uh, $120 for the entire six classes or $25 per class. That's a steal to be taught by this brother. I'm just telling you, okay? Um, and then for more information and for vending information also, if you want to be a vendor, contact Ayana or Greg at area code 973-388-4900. 973-388-4900. Or 862-944-8860, 862-944-8860. And uh, you can also email Afro Queens United, Afro Queens, Q U E E N S, Afro Queens United at gmail.com, Afro Queens United at gmail.com. And uh, visit uh, Brother Kaba's website, Kaba, Kamene, K A B A. K A M E N E, kabakamane.com. And you can order his DVD lectures there and get his uh, book list and a lot of information there. Um, go ahead, Brother Kaba, with any last words. And, and, go ahead. Yeah, brother, I just wanted to add that if you go to kabakamane.com, I've made available last Saturday's class, the first class on West Africa, is now available uh, for purchase when you go to kabakamane.com. Wow. Okay. It's also on my Facebook page. Okay. If you if you want to go to my Facebook page, uh, uh, Kaba Kamene, or you can go to my education page, uh, Professor Kaba, or you can go to my other Facebook page, Panther Prince Per Unk, P A P A N T A T R P R I N C E P E R A N K H, and you'll see the URL for. Uh, the particular um, DVD on West Africa, which is the origin of humanity in Africa and its movement to West Africa. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, look, Professor Kaba, we have to have you uh, back on again. And um, uh, people look out for Elementary, Elementary Genocide Part 3, which comes out August 22nd, 2017. Professor Kaba Kamene is in that documentary from director Raheem Shabazz. I'm in there also, as well as Professor James Small and Shaherazad Ali and some other people also. All right, brother. Well, look, man, it's always good talking to you. And we're going to have you back on uh, very soon as well. Probably maybe next month. Probably next month we'll have you back on right before uh, the class, right before the August 19th class. We'll, we'll have you back on. All right. OK, brother. Sounds that good to me, brother. Thank you so much, brother, and both for this opportunity. And I thank the family for uh, tuning in. And uh, just keep on keeping on because it ain't over till we win. Absolutely, man. Okay, hope that to you and the family, okay? Hope to you and yours, my brother. All right. Okay, man. Peace. Take care. Peace. All right. You too, brother, man. All right. Okay, so that was Professor Kaba Kamene. And uh, we got to have him back on again very soon, talking about his... A uh, six-week course uh, in the Newark, New Jersey area, a history of West Africa, ancient to Ma ancient to 1492. But if you're not in that area, you can go to his website, kabakamene.com, K-A-B-A-K-A-M-E-N-E, kabakamene.com. You can order the DVD uh, DVDs of the class there also. And I uh, also want to remind you that uh, on Fridays, I teach my online course, uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This is a 12-hour, um, a six-week online course. Um, sometimes we go over. Um, we deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with the transatlantic slave trade chronologically as much as possible as opposed to episodically. Uh, it's only the online course. This is a, uh, online course. We do it live Friday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, but all the sessions are recorded. So if you miss any of it, it's, it's uh, $40. Uh, go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register there. As soon as you register, you can watch, uh, the first, you, you can watch the first four classes, but you can also, we have about 12 hours of bonus content there. That you can watch also okay africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com and if you're watching on our facebook fan page 
uh, the African History Network. We're posting a link here on the thread. Uh, just one asked us to post the links. Uh, so we're posting the link here uh, also for the online course. And uh, we'll post a link here for our website, africanhistorynetwork.com also, okay?